Hello and welcome to Furious Driving and today I'm at the wheel of possibly the most luxurious Vectra you have ever seen. Yes, this is the rare, the exclusive, actually is an exclusive trim level. This is a Vauxhall Signum. This is a weird car, frankly. It's a big, comfortable Vectra Estate and it's got a fridge in the back and it's super luxury but in a not luxury class and that's a really interesting bus. Yeah, it's a weird one. Let's take a look around but before we do that please do hit like and really do hit subscribe because as I keep on saying trying to hit the 100,000 subscriber mark, that magic moment, we're very close. Please do help us out with that. A quick word from our sponsors and on with the review. Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. Follow the links in the description below. Hello and welcome to Furious Driving. And if you've been woken in the middle of the night in the wee small hours thinking to yourself, what is the most luxurious Vauxhall Vectra money could buy? Then this, my friend, is the answer you've been seeking. This, the biggest Vectra on the market, the most exclusive Vectra ever made, We'll call it the Signum, for that is its name. Let's take a look around. The Signum is an interesting one. It's a curiosity. It's an answer to a question that, frankly, no one was asking, and yet GM decided to build something similar on both sides of the Atlantic and sold almost none of them. We could, in fact, call this the Vauxhall Phaeton because it's a very similar idea to the big Volkswagen in so much as a regular, non-exclusive brand went out and built something that was very, very exclusive and everyone went, sorry, you're doing what now? Uh, okay, that, that's fine, but I'll take a Corsa. Anyway, so this is the Signum. This car ran from 2003 until 2008, so not a long production run at all. And they all were screwed together in Rüsselheim in Germany. So we're gonna assume they're well put together. They're built on the GM Epsilon platform, which is a well-established thing. It underpins a few well-known cars, as well as the Vauxhalls. There's a Saab 93, the Fiat Chroma, the Chevy Malibu, and the Saturn Aura. And in America, there was the Chevy Malibu Max, which was, again, a very similar thing. Putting it in very simple UK domestic market terms, it's a Vectra Estate four-seater with limo doors at the back. Because if you're gonna be buying a limo, you're gonna be buying a limo with a Griffin on the front. Goes without saying. Looks wise, it's not very easy to pigeonhole. It's Vectra at the front. It looks a lot like an Astra at the back and it's got hints of Astra and Vectra Estate all about it. But the big thing is these rear doors because this is proper limo spec access to an enormous rear area. And we've still got an estate style boot behind this. This is really, really curiously long and unusually proportioned. However, it's not a bad looking car in this particular shade of metallic turquoisey blue. It's rather, rather attractive as it goes. This does put it in a slightly awkward position to be sold. We've seen this kind of thing with Rovers in the past where they're neither fish nor fowl in terms of, of car category because it's a family car, which is as big as a luxury car and they're selling a family car for luxury car money. And so it's just falling foul of not quite being one thing or the other. But let's take a look inside because that's where the good stuff is with one of these cars. Now stepping inside, we'll pull the chunky door handle. That slides out, the door pops open. You'll notice though, we have got fairly dark windows at the front. We've got full on limo tints in the back because limo and you'll see a fairly high degree of specification and luxury items. This car, as you may have spotted on the door, is an exclusive, which is a mid-range car. However, the owner has been and found an awful lot of elite items to bring this thing up to spec, including this full leather interior. So this is a nice addition to the car. Now, typically Vauxhall, it's a fairly firm, hard-wearing leather, which looks rather nice, and it's in a perfectly matching shade to the steering wheel, which I believe is leather as well, and everything else around us. On the doors, on the doors, we've got very much more of the same. I don't know if there's actual leather or pleather, but this came with the car with this rather interesting gray streaking effect insert panel, like a streaky gray wood kind of thing and a satin effect finish silvery plastic bit and some good quality, very firm, non-rattling, I have to say. Uh, elephant hide down there, big speakers, little chrome door handle, solid door pull and a big panel of stuff. So we've got our front electric windows, central locking, electric mirrors and a lockout slider. Interesting though, we haven't got rear electric windows on the door in this particular model, which I thought there would be, to be honest. We've got lots of adjustment on the seats, climb aboard. Right, here we go. Now, 
It's actually quite a nice seating position. I've not adjusted this for myself at all, but already it's feeling rather nice. So rather traditionally, we do have a matching door on the other side, which is very much to be expected. We've got a perfect tea shelf. Oh, well done, Vauxhall, for the tea shelfery at large just here. It is huge and it is flat. Slight down mark for having vents that drop down into the dashboard, so if you knock over a cup of tea, it will go straight into the dash and destroy things. That aside, you've got a room for a smorgasbord of, of snacks up on here. Perfect. Ideal snackery location up there. The dashboard itself comes across from that big flat top to a very, very vertical front just there, which is, uh, which is where you hide the airbag in case of bad stuff. Following on from the door pattern, we've got our satin finished silver there. We've got our streaking gray wood effect just there and a big glove box underneath. Vauxhall. Um, <laughs> in the center, we have got a color screen. It's quite small by modern standards, but back in 2006, this was pretty much cutting edge and very exciting indeed. Either side of that, we have got our air vents, which are controlled by these chrome edged wheels. Underneath that, we have got a bank, a very vertical bank of controls. On the left and right hand side at the top, we've got our heated seats, which is a slightly unusual location, but actually very sensible because you can see exactly where they are and what's going on. Very large hazard warning light just there. And a few blankers, which is unexpected perhaps on a car of this Calibra. I mean Calibra, sorry, wrong Vauxhall. Anyway, in the center, we've got a shaped radio. This is a thing that was very much happening back at this point in time. And uh, to defeat car radio thieves, the manufacturers would integrate their radio into the dashboard. So it's completely useless to anyone who has not got another signum with the same radio in it. So quite a good idea. And it gave the designers kind of free reign to make the dashboards what they wanted them to be. Underneath that, we have got our air conditioning controls. Apparently aircon is good in this car, which is nice. Dual zone climate would have come with the next stage up with the Elite. Uh, the owner has said he's looked into doing that. It's possible, but uh, it does mean taking the dashboard out, so he's left it for now. We've got a little rubber-bottomed storage area underneath there, a 12-volt socket and a little ashtray. Behind that, very pleased to see a nice six-speed manual gearbox, leather trimmed at the top and at the bottom. A fairly solid feeling action, so we'll see what that's like out on the road in a minute. And we've got a pair of very shallow cup holders indeed. I would not trust them on a roundabout for one second. Next to that, chunky handbrake with a chrome button on the end and a slightly creaky <laughs> armrest which slides forwards and backwards to give you perfect comfort situations. And there's a cubby hole underneath that for hiding stuff. In front of the driver, we have our instrument binnacles, which are livened up by a little chrome ring around each of the four dials. Temperature and fuel on the right and left. Our rev counter only going to 5,000 RPM, but I think it's a diesel in this car. And then a speedometer going up to 160, which is perhaps optimistic. It's very clear, very legible. Not very exciting, but it is very, very clear indeed. Moving back, we've got the, as I say, grey leather steering wheel matching the seats very nicely. We've got steering wheel controls on here. Volume, radio up and down, random things to do with I don't know, stuff. And of course, the horn. Oh, limousine parp. We like. Up top, we have got a slowly opening but very large glasses holder. You can put some properly large Prada specs in there. Big bank of lights. And then, being as this is a limousine, let's have a look in the back. Now, it's not often you walk up to a regular everyday car and the rear door is longer than the front door. But in this case, we do. And that is an absolutely enormous door. And trim-wise, it's very much the same as in the front. We've got tough, non-rattly, slightly soft touch elephant hide. We've got our satin finish. We've got our, oh, no streaky wood. Streaky wood's missing from the back. Nice pleather armrest, solid door pull. Nice little chrome thing. The tweeter up here by the window switch. So it is electric windows in the back, of course about to step inside but look how much space we have here it's always oh, huge you are properly like you're in luxury private car hire situation here it's only designed as a two-seater you can have a third seat option i believe but this one though has got the fridge option in here so the armrest is a refrigerator which is super cool super cool that lifts up to be a thing. This, I believe, is one of those old projectors we had in school. So there's, you can do a presentation on the windscreen about uh, Oxbow Lakes and so forth with that. On the front of this big panel here with the, the pull-up 
school projector. I thought it was having a button to retract it again. We've got a pair of 12 volt sockets, not USBs because the car is slightly too old for that, but you can charge things nonetheless. We've also got, then in the back of the front console, we've got an ashtray, we've got another 12 volt socket. We've got radio controls, which can control the tuner and the CD and the power from the radio in the front. And in fact, the little Easter egg of this car is you can listen to something different in the back to the front through the same system. So you can have a CD in one end of the car and a radio in the other. I believe that's actually a twin CD player in the front of the head unit. I didn't notice that before. Impressive or what? And of course, we've also got another little cubby hole just there and we've got storage just there. No storage in the doors, you'll notice, but lots and lots of headroom because the roof of the car stays horizontal for a very long time well behind where we're sitting. I can't do this one-handed, but these seat backs also fold forward to make it into a very useful large estate car. And these seats actually slide forward as well if you need to make just a more usable, bigger load space, smaller rear space, because frankly, who needs that much legroom? It's ridiculous. Now, jumping in the back of the boot, surprisingly not got an automated tailgate. Well, maybe we're a couple of years too early for that to be uh, on a more mainstream car, even though they are targeting this as super luxury. So I don't know where we would stand with that, really. Right, we have got a load space cover, and you can see it is a big old load space in here. It's quite narrow, which is a, it's actually a common Vauxhall thing I've found over the years looking at various Vauxhall cars. The load space is often a little bit narrow. We've got oops, luggage stash in the right-hand side for our first aid, even marked up as such. We've got lots of nets and things in here more luggage stash on the left and the fuse boxes we've got quickly undo the net and we have got a full size or well, space saver spare wheel wow fantastic i love finding a proper spare wheel in the back of one of these cars such a big improvement on a silly pump thing and we've got a dog guard in here so i'm guessing dogs get taken out in here from time to time but this is a lovely big space and of course limo tinted here at the front, it is pure Vectra. Well, I say pure Vectra, it's a very smart Vectra. We've got lots of chrome, we've got the big headlights, we've got an amazing color on this car. And we've got this nice lower grille with the chrome edging and we've got the chrome surround on the fog lights as well and the extra little grills there. So the whole thing does have a very nice detailed premium feel at the front, even though it does look at first glance very much like a squared off Vectra. Right, let's get the Signum on the road. I've never driven a Signum before, so this is quite exciting. <laughs> now, one thing I didn't notice, or definitely a diesel, one thing I didn't notice when I was uh, doing the walk around, because the instrument stalks were right behind the steering wheels, just how square they are. And the rubber at the bottom is kind of integrated little concertina thing, which is also very, very square and angular. This is very much a Vauxhall thing, all these, well, the sharp edges. to get the aircon running, because it is really warm. Right, okay, so manual gearbox, heavy, heavy throw into first, and off we go. Let's head out onto the dual carriageway first of all, and see what we think of that. These are the days of the very early one touch and three flash indicators, which Top Gear really didn't like at the time, did they? Now the Ecotec diesel has got a fair degree of torque to it. In second gear, pulling up to 45, into third, just nudging 50 because we are going past the speed camera. Now something I was anticipating from this car because of its long wheelbase was a lovely smooth ride on the dual carriageway which is why I've headed straight out here to see what it's like in what I'm going to assume is its natural habitat. And it is very nice indeed. There's a bit of road noise, more than I was expecting actually. And we do float a little bit over the bumps and things but overall it's really quite nice. And this gearbox is quite a heavy shift. A little bit notchy going in from one gear to the next. But it does go in very positively. There's no ambiguity about whether you're in gear or not. It slots in nicely. If you want to use that in a hurry, if you're getting a bit spirited, I think that'll be actually very, very comfortable and enjoyable to use, actually. Ah, oh, 
like this is where we go with these indicators. You give it a light tap, you get three flashes. You give it a slightly firmer tap, it just stays on. Then you have to tap it in either direction to turn it off. Let's say James May and Clarkson hated this at the time. They said there was going to be scrapyards full of voxels with indicators just flashing forever and ever more. <laughs> Little did they know that pretty much every car manufacturer was going to do something very similar shortly afterwards. Now this is quite a big car, it's effectively a long wheelbase Vauxhall Vectra Estate, but with much nicer interior. You don't generally notice this until you get into tight corners and narrow lanes, then you start to see it, or feel it I should say. With the diesel, the initial pickup isn't that huge, but once you're on the road and moving, then the turbo kicks in and then you do throw down the road pretty rapidly. Yeah, it does feel quite spirited to drive for such a big car. I think if you put an automatic in this, it would very much dull the experience quite considerably. There we go. 70 miles an hour, there's a little bit of wind noise around the pillars now but generally, it's still okay. Right, this is gonna be an interesting little turn because this is a nice set of bends. Yeah, it does go around that corner quite nicely. The Signum was only available in UK and mainland Europe, but it was a tough sell for the Vauxhall and Opel dealers to get out the door. The manufacturer insisted that all the dealers took some and had to buy some and they wound up pre-registering them because otherwise they weren't going to fly out the door. They were expensive cars that just weren't finding buyers. This did mean though it was a brilliant bargain either for fleet buyers who realised that they could haggle a brilliant deal and instead of getting a mid-range Vectra they could go and get themselves a really well spec Signum instead because the dealer just wanted them gone or used buyers, family buyers who wanted, well, a lot of space in the back so they could separate siblings with a big fridge in between them and not have them kicking the back of their chairs. I mean, how much space do you need for a child seat? There's a lot in there. And it was a brilliant buy, well, for family buyers because they could walk into their local Vauxhall dealership and get one of these things for basically a third or almost a half off on a brand new car with three or four miles on the clock and absolutely loaded with way more spec than they would normally be able to get for their budget. All they had to put up with was an extra name on the V5, a couple of people who work in the office at the dealership having three or four cars in their name at any one time and then being obviously sold on immediately afterwards. This is a brilliant way of buying a car. I did it with my first Freelander. I think I paid under 14,000 pounds for a brand new high spec Freelander with loads of toys on it. Great way of doing things. So what started off as a premium car wound up being an incredible bargain in the end. And in a way they still are. They are an awful lot of car for the money. Although finding one these days is getting trickier and trickier because it's one of those niche cars that didn't find a loving appreciative audience in big numbers at first. But now the people who do love them really do want them again. And so the guy who owns this car has owned it twice. He bought it when it was fairly new, having sort of sought out a particular spec and color. And then later on, he wanted another one, or in fact wanted this one back for sentimental reasons and found it and he's just recently had it re-sprayed. Likes it that much. I think he said it's one of, one of the best cars he's ever owned. And I know he's owned quite a few. Holy galoshes, I stopped over to move my GoPros and we're about to be passed by, believe it or not, a BT Cruiser with chrome wheels. Oh my goodness me. My Christmases have come early. And I've been given coal. <laughs> anyway, as I was about to say before the Cruiser so rudely interrupted me, the the Signum was first shown to the world, or hinted at the world, back in 2001 as a concept car called the Signum 2, which is slightly curious because it came out before the original Signum, but that's GM for you. Now these are some particularly nasty speed humps, I've said that before on videos, but this is riding over them very, very comfortably indeed. Vauxhalls do tend to ride on the hard side, but this is actually quite, quite comfy actually. The car 
car leans a little bit through a corner, but really not very much at all. And the, and the grip is actually really rather impressive. I notice this has got some very nice Goodyear tires on it, which will of course help. Yeah, chuck it into a bend, it just goes round. I mean, this is meant to be a luxury car, a little hint of scrabble as you pull out of the corner. This car is very much though a contradiction in terms. It is being sold as a luxury car, but it's from a mainstream brand. They've done the luxury stuff. We've got the limo back seats, but not with the soft touch leather. And you haven't got the fancy materials and finishes as you'd expect on a car demanding that kind of a premium. So it's a very unusual car to try and work out what to think of it as really. I'm trying to think of it as a very, very comfortable Vectra. That's the best thing I can come up with really. Because if you think of it in those terms, it's actually very complimentary. If you think of it as, uh, I don't know, if you think of it as a Mercedes or Jag rival, then you're gonna start thinking of it rather negatively because although the fit and finish is very good, there's not a single squeak or rattle in this car, it's got 140,000 miles on it, then we haven't got the same quality of leather, we haven't got the same dashboard materials, so then it falls over, unfortunately. fling through a corner surprisingly well for such a big car. I can see why the owner enjoys it so much because it's completely under the radar, but at the same time does give you quite a nice luxury car feeling. And you're not gonna find another one in a car park, that's for sure. Well, thank you for watching. I do hope you've enjoyed this look around this really unusual and rare Vauxhall, not a car you come across every day of the week by any means at all. So unusual for such a big volume manufacturer to have such an unusually uncommon car. If you've enjoyed this, please, as always, hit like and subscribe and join us again next time driving something completely different.